I'm able to get through most things, but um, but maybe also I, I haven't also maybe experienced like total tragedy in my life yet. So and I'm sure one day I will, and maybe I'll be able to answer that question better okay, yeah. then. I was at home with my brother. I got a text from my dad saying, it's pretty routine actually, but he was like, Can I, are you together? I need to call you. I'll call you at this time. Um, actually, she was already dead by then, but I didn't know that. So he called us and just said like, I don't really know how to tell you this, but mum's dead. He said that she hung herself in the house upstairs. Every insecurity I had, every worry, every like anxiety just came in one hit after about two months. Um, and I was just a complete wreck. I have a lot of my mum's characteristics, so I don't know, maybe wear my heart on my sleeve a bit more, or have done about it. My dad's a very stoic man, so he's very like, you know, life must go on. Like, he was the guy that would say, right, you know, I'm, I'm going back to work on Monday or whatever, like, after the funeral, what, what, what are you guys doing, kind of thing. But he just has this very, like, placid, you know, like, obviously devastated, but, you know, you, might, you have to move on with your life and just make the best of it. I used to not like this phrase, but I do now. I think you're never given more than you can handle in life. And I think having experienced the worst thing possible, losing a parent, particularly like that, you, um, like, yeah, you, you're like, well, if I can, if I've dealt with that, I, nothing else can be as bad. I was driving and my dad called me, so I pulled over and he's just sobbing. I've literally never heard my dad cry in my life. My auntie, um, bless her, she was really young. She actually passed away from cancer. Now this is his little sister, this is like his baby sister, do you know what I mean? So I just remember hearing this like shell of a man. And yeah, I just, I had to kind of be there for my dad. He nearly passed away due to alcohol, so We've kind of had like a bit of a rough ride, but basically I think he's always tried to falsely maintain positivity. Like, you know, when you try to create this false positivity of life of like, okay, I'm so happy that it doesn't affect me anymore, so I don't need to let anything out. Maybe that combined with like, I don't know, just being numb to so many things, the average thing's not gonna make him cry, but also he comes from a time, I think as well, it's a generational thing where I think generation above us, it's not masculine at all for a man to let out his emotions. Um, again, I think I'm, I'm very lucky that I was raised by a single mum and she showed me it's okay to be feminine, that like it's okay to be sensitive, it's okay to have emotions. And I think that's very important for me because that's where I get a lot of my inspiration from, is from my own emotions. Like, you say you're feeling down and trust me, I know the feeling. Some days can't leave the house, we schedule another meeting. Exhausted to the core, I'm still having trouble with sleeping. I used to smoke myself to oblivion in the evenings, but the first step to healing is discovering the weakness. And if you feel there's nothing to believe in, well, let me give you something to believe in. Last year, um, when I'd say I hit my rock bottom, um, mentally, I was chasing something that I thought I wanted to be. I look around, I see a lot of guys my age and even younger that are just cut off and it's really scary. It becomes, that creates fear for me because I think a man who can't feel, I don't know, it's kind of, you lose control, do you know what I mean?
think it's more of a habit, which is never asking for help. And I think that comes with the, the machoism as a male, that uh, we're supposed to have it together, right? Uh, so I think that's my biggest failure. And I think if I would have done that sooner in life, um, I don't know, things might have been a little bit more clear, might have been a little bit more wiser. I was always told that I was going to be the man at the house, right? Like the man at the house, you're the man at the house, Mike. I had no idea what that, what does that entail, right? So my definition of man at the house was from people that I saw on TV, right? Like, like sitcom shows, like Tim Allen on Home Improvement, things like that, like, like classic what a uh, father's supposed to be. And I took like traits from that and I tried to adopt it into who I was. And then over the years, that just became my, my persona in a way. And uh, I think it was that void of not having a father. My father passed away when I was three years old. I don't know where we were going to, but we were, we were driving in a green Chevy Astro van. That's like the only thing that I remember. And uh, the car spun out of control and uh, we like steered off the side of the road. And uh, I think it rolled over maybe a couple of times. And uh, yeah, I think he passed away in the, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. So. How do you think that shaped who you are today? I got my shit together, that I could manage, I could take care of things, that I'm a provider, that I come in support. Um, you know, those are great attributes, but you know, the truth of the matter is, is that days I'm broken, right? Like I'm, I don't have my shit together. I just want to be in a, in a shell. Uh, but then last week I was feeling great. So it comes and goes. Wealth is where I continue the cycle. It's got all these cars, big house. My children go to public school. I go to Oxford, Cambridge, or somewhere. I didn't get in. I'm sorry, Dad. But um, <clears throat> I was meant to. Only man, only man for the last few generations not to go to Oxford. Um, I decided to uh, take drugs and, and not do anything. Um, my father was managing director of the largest insurance company in the world and has spent much of his time in this building. Nothing seemed wrong to anyone. And, you know, that evening, he rang my mother from the garden after taking my brother back to boarding school. And um, he said that he felt he could not go on and that he felt the best thing for our family was that he was no longer a part of it. And by the time my mum had realised the gravity of the conversation, she was on her way halfway downstairs and she had a gunshot from the garden. And my father had shot himself in the garden um, under a tree. And you know, our family has not been the same since. He was terrified of being fired. He was terrified of being passed over for promotion. And I think that that was a metaphorical gun to his head. At the start, I liked the attention that came with having something to cry about, you know, it's like, this thing has happened to me. And it's after the weeks initially that things died down and I was left alone with the gravity of the situation. And, you know, I um, started using drugs to help go to sleep to start with. And I was in the graveyard by dad's grave and I remember looking at the river and wanting to drown myself in the river because I didn't know how to deal with the situation. I felt very alone and my mother didn't work. We were completely, I, 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 what, where in life's instruction manual does it say like in the event of a family suicide, do X, Y, Z? I lost the ability to throw on the armor eventually. I ended up in a psychotic uh, episode. I went, um, I, I overdosed and um, had a sort of manic psychosis. I got, you know, uh, 
injected and taken in. So yeah, that was the low point. <laughs> You're a fake. No one really wants you around. And actually, you'd probably be better off disappearing. In whatever form that takes. I may go and disappear and close the doors when I'm not feeling great. And it's told me at times I should just disappear altogether. Should we say touchy-feely society now? We're very, very easy to go and seek um, counselling and, 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 and a psychiatrist for every little last thing. You know, if you lose your dog, you can go and see a psychiatrist about it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a totally different world we live in now. <sighs> my favourite memory with my father was certainly going to a market called Petticoat Lane Market. At one end, it sold second-hand bicycles, push bikes, and we would we would buy the rustiest one, take it home, rub it down with sandpaper and stuff, respray it, rebuild it, and uh, that would be my bike. <laughs> <laughs> was most afraid in my life. Um, unfortunately, I had an incident. Um, I'd only been driving the taxi for, as a cabbie, for about two years. A group of youngsters decided to get off a bus and all run across the road. Uh, the ones, the ones that got off the bus and run to the back of the bus were all safe, but the one guy that chose the wrong route was collected by my taxi, unfortunately, uh, and that was probably my worst moment. I honestly felt that um, I'd lost everything because of this incident. I'd lost everything that I'd worked for. Because to become a London taxi driver, you know, you put a lot of work in, uh, to get this badge is, you know, I still to this day, 21 years this year, still kiss the badge. It still means that much to me. So I thought I'd lost that. So selfishly, I felt, you know, that it had all been taken away from me. But and how old was the person? He was 14. Yeah, he was 14. Because of what happened to the, the child, it wasn't for anyone to come and look after me. So I kind of was left on my own. And um, you know, I had to uh, deal with it all by myself, really. There was no, you know, counseling or anything like that that was for me. But, you know, at the end of the day, I was, I was still alive. So I, I kind of understand that it weren't about me. They're still there, it's always going to be there, it's never going to go away, is it? You, know, you can't, it's, it's not a nice thing to to have to um, deal with for anybody. Certainly not, you know, somebody who works and drives a taxi for a living. I'm able to get through most things, but um, but maybe also I, I haven't also maybe experienced yeah. like total tragedy in my life yet. So and I'm sure one day I will, and maybe I'll be able to answer that question better. Then, <laughs> strangely, I'm I'm probably not the most open person, and people often presume that I am. Um, I feel it's completely acceptable for me to say the most intimate of things in a song, which I'd never say to someone to their face. Um, and I don't know if that's because I'm a bloke or because I'm English. <laughs> it's yeah. probably a bit of both. <laughs> yeah, I think it's both. What kind of things do you see as important to live a 
to happy life. I've been aware and all the time learning and realizing how delicate we all are and vulnerable. Everyone uh, wants to give this impression of a perfect life and it puts this great pressure on people to have m money and friends and, uh, you know, eclectic cultural tastes and, you know, or whatever their, their, their sort of pressure is. Um, and I think that can be uh, debilitating, certainly. I mean, occasionally you do meet those, like, people that you're like, you're like, you really have got it worked out, haven't you? Like, you meet a dog walker in the park and he's just like, seems to just be really content with his life. But it's very difficult to achieve that, I think. If I'm going to say that when I'm in my 40s, and I'll say that about myself now, is, you know, don't worry so much. Um, so I try and tell myself that a lot, like, don't worry so much. Um, but I don't, <laughs> you know, we all do anyway, don't we? Somebody said to me the other day, oh, God, you have such a blessed life, <laughs> you know? And I thought, do I? <laughs> yeah? OK. Well, I don't know whose life you're seeing, but, uh, you know, on the inside here. I remember feeling particularly guilty because um, his friend Craig, who had been up and down having various difficulties, and um, I felt a bit ill, and I knew I had a lot of stuff to do on the Monday. And um, so I cancelled. I said, I can't make it, and, um, you know. Um, and I forgot about it, and a couple of weeks later, I, you know, tried phoning, and there was no answer. And um, then I emailed. And um, then his mother got back to me. And um, she said, oh, I... So you called a few times, and I just wanted to let you know that um, he killed himself. So you look at you look at those situations, and do you think um, if he had had more of an outlet, then would you know would he be alive? <sighs> Yeah, you've got to weigh up a lot of factors. I think, you know, I have occasionally had fleeting thoughts of, um, oh, wouldn't it be, you know, good if it all just ended, you know, just, if I throw myself on this you know, tube line with that, um, you know. But actually, you know, then you think, you know, what would my kids think? What would I be leaving them as a legacy? Hopefully, I will always have um, somewhere where I can you know, at least pick up the phone and go, hi, you know what, well, I'd like to have a cup of coffee. I'm just feeling a little vulnerable. Yeah. I'm not really that worried about the future. I'm kind of happy with change. I accept change and I'm, I'm happy that as the days and months of your life tick by, there will always be change and I'm good at adjusting to it. So I'm not really worried that much. <laughs>